So where necessary, um, we'll ask our colleague uh, uh, Tepa to help us with the translations for, from English to French and sometimes vice versa. Um, so with those housekeeping issues out of the way, I would like us to do a quick uh, um, exercise to you know, uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, sometimes uh, when you're doing a virtual meeting, it can feel like you are talking to robots and so on, but we need to know that actually it's human beings who are at the other end of the call. So could we all please turn on our cameras and uh, we'd like, I'll go through the list of introductions and please, when I get to you, just wave and, uh, you know, what I'm doing, just to show that you are there. Um, so I hope that is okay for all of us, if you don't mind. Could you turn on your cameras? I see some people didn't turn on their cameras. Good. Okay, so with those turned on, I will just go down the list. And um, please, if I mention your name, uh, just turn on your camera and wave and so that we can know you are there. So I'll start with the uh, participants on the call from the ECOWAS. Um, do we have uh, Dr. Yao Bernard Coffey, who is the senior program officer at the Commission's One Health program? Please just wave, spotlight it. Okay. Okay, maybe he's going to join us soon. Okay, and uh, Dr. Vajil Lukusu from ECOWAS as well. Uh, we also have from ECOWAS Dr. Benoit, who is the senior advisor, sanitary and phytosanitary from the ECOWAS Commission. Ah, good. I see you. Good. Nice to have you on the call, Benoit. Um, so I will move on to the FARA. Uh, Dr. Yemi Akim Bamibujo, who is the executive director. Yemi? Hi, good. We see you there. Good, thank you. Good. Um, we also have from, uh, we'll move on to Koraf and uh, Dr. Abdu Tenkwano, the executive director. I heard his voice, so I know he's somewhere. <laughs> Abdu? <laughs> yeah. Abdu? Ah, good. I can see you, Abdu. Just wave so that we know that you're there. Good, good, great, fabulous, yeah. Um, so um, we'll move on to the Permanent Interstate Committee for Drought Control in the Sahel. CILSS. Uh, do we have Dr. Suleimani Drago or Drago? Okay, I think he's coming to join us if he's not already on the call. Yeah, um, he will join us later. Ah, good. He's here. He says he will join later. Okay, okay. Um, what about Dr. Idrissa Maiga? I think I saw him somewhere on the call. Hi. Hi, Idrissa. Good. Nice to see Hi. you. Welcome to the webinar. Um, from the Norwegian Agency for Development and Cooperation, do we have Dr. Daniel Franz Van Hilst? Ah, good. Nice to have you. Um, from World Resource Institute, Dr. Rebecca Carter? Good. Nice to have you. Um, and from the same institute, Dr. Cristina Del Rio. Good, hello. Um, from the CCAFs, Dr. Bruce Campbell. Yeah. yeah, see you, Bruce. And also from CCAFs, Dr. Robert Zogmo. Great. So we are going down the list. Um, from Nibio, Dr. Per, I think he was on the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, nice to have you. And uh, from INRAB, Dr. Adolfe. Not yet here, but I think he'll join us. Um, yeah. From IFAD, uh, Dr. Barry Abdul. 
Okay, not here yet, but I think he'll join us uh, a couple more. Uh, people will join as we go along. Um, from GIZ, Dr. Dagmar. Yeah, I think he, he wrote actually an apology that he will join uh, the, the meeting later. So yeah, he will be with us. From the Bill and Melinda Gates, Dr. Christina Owen. Okay. Yeah. And uh, from the Benin Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. Francois. This me now. Ah, good. Hello, Francois. Good. Nice to have you. Good. And from BIMAF, we have a couple of people. Dr. Malik Ba. Dr. El Fati Abdel Rahman. Good. Nice to have you. Uh, Dr. Carl Toons. Nibio. Lucky for all of you, my camera is broken, so I have to wave this way. <laughs> ah, good. Okay. Still, it's good to have you on the call. Uh, Ruzu Joaka, Dr. Ruzu Joaka. Good. Nice to have you. Uh, Dr. Afari Sefa from Walvage. Good, Victor, I can see you. Uh, Dr. Jesse Nav. Good, yes, we can see you there. And Dr. Agali Al Hassan. Okay, I think he'll join soon. Um, right, so we move on to IITA. We also have a couple of participants here from IITA. Uh, Dr. Christian Burgemaster, who is also the board chair for IITA. Good, nice to have you on the call. Uh, Dr. May Guri. Mm -hmm. Hello, nice to have you, May Guri. Uh, Dr. Robert Asiedu is here next to me. <laughs> yeah, nice to have you, Robert. And uh, Michael Abaton. Hello, I'm here. Good. Uh, you, your camera is off, Michael. We wanted yeah. to see you. <laughs> no, I think it's better like this. Okay, good. We have Dr. Chikoy as well. David. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Manuel Tamo. Good, Manu. Uh, Gislaine Tepayoto. Good afternoon. Uh, Sirik. Is he on? No, I guess he's joining soon. Okay. Uh, we have Kathy Lopez as well from IITA. Uh, of course, uh, Yinka Fakunle, and uh, they're giving us technical backstopping. Uh, we have some additional people from IMI, uh, Dr. Kofi Olfunke. Are you on the call, Kofi? Not yet. Okay. And um, from the European Center for Development Policy Management, ECDPM, Dr. Francesco Rampa. Yeah. And finally, last but not the least, uh, also from ECDPM, Dr. Han. Uh, good. Nice to have you. So, um, I mean, this is a, an exercise that we just wanted to make sure that actually uh, we are interacting and we are talking to colleagues and people that we know and people we share common objectives with. Uh, without uh, taking much more time and with those introductions done with, I would like us to switch over now to get some opening remarks from two individuals who are already put in the agenda. Could I welcome Dr. Christian Bogomaster to give us some opening remarks? And Christian, uh, we'll have your slide up in a bit, so just unmute and then uh, it will be up in a bit. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, um, friends. It's uh, very nice to be uh, with you, if, even if it's only virtually. I saw on this long list uh, a couple of um, old friends and colleagues that I hadn't seen for quite some time. So at least it's nice to uh, virtually reconvene. Um, 
I'm here to give you uh, a couple of uh, um, opening remarks on uh, linking One Health to climate change um, and uh, engaging key stakeholders for an active partnership and synergies uh, to address One Health in a, in a holistic way. Um, the objectives of this webinar are uh, three. We would like to see a, a, a buy-in from key regional and international participating stakeholders like you to this uh, One Health uh, re regional uh, grand challenge issue on pests and diseases. We would like to hear from you, uh, your perspectives on, uh, on the, the major pests and diseases um, that you consider of greatest importance uh, in West Africa. We would like to obviously get your advice on the, the envisaged One Health RGC1 and uh, how you could add value to ongoing and planned initiatives under the, the four strategic uh, priorities of this RGC1, which I'll come to in a sec. What do we hope to get out of this, um, this whole webinar? We would obviously we would like to get an endorsement, if possible, from the participants of, of this um, activity here. We would like to collate your, your perspectives on the said major pests and diseases and that the challenges that they pose for agriculture in West Africa. And we would like to get some orientation vis-a-vis -vis these four strategic priorities um, uh, of the One Health RGC1. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So questions I, I would like to ask you to keep in mind um, for, for the plenary um, towards the end uh, of the, the, this webinar, so after the presentations, is um, what's the added value of this RGC1 One Health Platform for Climate-Driven Pests and Diseases in West Africa. We hope there are plenty of added values, but um, that's definitely something we would like to, to hear from you. Um, and then coming back to the key strategic priorities, what would you recommend uh, this partnership to work on? Uh, could there be different priorities in different agroecological zones, for example, or in countries? Presently, um, um, we are we are contemplating uh, on on the, the, the these four priorities um, these four strategic priorities. One would be horizon scanning and building early warning and rapid response systems. Uh, the second would be managing um, climate driven bio risks, be it pests or be it diseases. Uh, the third would be high, harnessing high throughput technologies for food safety and help for these growing mega cities in, in West Africa. And the fourth would be mainstreaming bio risk uh, management into national and regional development programs. Now, these are the, 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 these four strategic priorities that we could envisage. Are these the correct ones? Question. Do we need a fifth? Do we need a sixth? So these are the issues we would, um, we would love to, to hear from you during this, um, this webinar. Uh, to which I'm very much looking forward to. With these few words, I would like to pass on the baton to uh, Maiguri, who will continue. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, mm -hmm. Christian. Uh, please, could I have the next slide? So I'm very delighted uh, to welcome all of you to this kickoff webinar on the Regional Grand Challenge 1, uh, which we have labeled the One Health Platform for climate-driven pests and diseases in West Africa. Um, this is one of the eight grand challenges under the new CDIR Two Degree Initiative uh, for food and agriculture. Next slide, please. Uh, as, you can, as you can see from, uh, from our um, program, uh, we, have a, we think we have put together a rather interesting program uh, after these opening remarks, uh, we will have uh, presentations uh, setting the scene from CCAFs, from the WRI, uh, from IITA, from FARA, from ECOWAS. Uh, and then we come to the real part of the discussion, 
uh, where we certainly would like to hear your opinions uh, and how we can move this uh, forward in a collaborative way. Uh, and uh, finally, at the agenda item six, uh, we will uh, have the help from uh, the executive director of CORAF to help us to look at the way forward and particularly to outline the plans for the face-to-face -face meeting, which we are hoping to hold uh, in uh, mid-September if the COVID situation uh, allows us. So the next slide, please. Um, so I will like to introduce you to the core team of this initiative. Uh, it is IRTA and uh, staff from the Biorisk Management Facility, Manuel Tamer, Shislatia Payotto, David Shikoya, and myself. And we have had great support uh, from Korov, who is also the chair of the BIMAF uh, uh, Independent Science Advance Advisory Panel, the executive director of Dutankwano. We are working together with ICRISAT, here represented by Malik Ba who is also a, men, a member of BIMOF. And definitely we are working together with uh, CCOFs and uh, the World Resource Institute, Bruce Campbell, Rebecca Carter, and Christina Del Rio. But from this point on, we definitely welcome national, regional, and continental institutions. Other CG centers, uh, international institutions, continental in institutions, donors, and investors to help us to create uh, a, an even better initiative than we have been able to do so far. So with these words, uh, I'm happy to welcome all of you and uh, I'm head heading back to Jonathan, thanks. Thank you very much, Meguri, for those opening remarks and Christian as well. Um, let's hear the second part of the opening and welcome remarks from uh, Francois. Dr. Francois. Bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde depuis Cotonou. Euh, au nom du ministre de l'Agriculture, de l'Élevage et de la Pêche, je souhaite la bienvenue à tous les participants et partenaires de cette noble initiative sous le Wangren. Un concept pleinement holistique et inclusif, intégrant la santé des plantes. Je saisis cette opportunité pour euh, remercier tous les partenaires qui, depuis la déclaration du président Patrice Talon à la COP22 de Marrakech, n'ont cessé d'approfondir les réflexions sur la promotion du projet du gouvernement béninois de voir le pays appliquer le centre international de recherche pour une agriculture résiliente au changement climatique. La stratégie du BIMAP est en parfaite harmonie avec la vision du programme d'action du gouvernement et rentre bien dans les défis actuels de l'agriculture béninoise, voire régionale. Gérer les risques liés au changement climatique afin de subvenir aux besoins alimentaires et nutritionnels des petits producteurs qui constituent la majeure partie de nos communautés agricoles. Le Bénin point de départ de l'initiative Irak, sauf cas de force majeure, sera fier d'accueillir à la suite de ce webinar une réunion présentielle à mi-septembre 2020 pour adresser les questions spécifiques concernant cet important challenge sur le One Health. Observant les mesures barrière contre la COVID-19. D'ici là, je vous souhaite à tous la pleine forme. Bonne réunion à tous. Merci. Thank you very much, Francois. And uh, I think uh, for the English speakers on the call, uh, the translation of the speech was actually already uh, being uh, shown. Um, so let's shift gears quickly to actually the first part of this uh, webinar, which is the setting the scene for the discussions that we are going to have today. And uh, we'll hear from the first presentation from Bruce Coleman, Co Campbell, sorry, uh, from CCAFS. Uh, Bruce, uh, we'll give you the control, Bruce, so you can run the presentation from your slide, from your side. 
Do you see it? Yes, it's up. Good. Okay. And the challenge is, unfortunately, that I can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, it's good. I've got it. Uh, nearly got it. Okay. Hi, yeah. everybody. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a very short presentation to the overall initiative. Um, I have to say sorry, we're having many of these meetings in different parts, different regions, and some of you have heard the presentation before, so excuse the repetition. Uh, so we're coming from, from a perspective where we think we really need to transform the food system. We released a report just last week, which is around this topic. And I could go into a number of different angles of why we need to um, transform the food system, but just here's one particular angle, looking at the trends in undernutrition. And we are not going to achieve SDG2 by 2030 using our current development research initiatives. We need to do something differently. And and we have to do that something differently against the background of climate change. And this is the number of natural catastrophes, weather related catastrophes from the insurance industry, and they've doubled in the last 20 years. So we've got very challenging targets in many different dimensions, and we've got up against climate change. And with climate change, farmers are selling productive assets, reducing numbers of meals to get by, migration, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of nice data showing what's happening. Climate change is already with us. This is some of the latest data from uh, on vulnerability to climate hazards. And as you can see, West Africa, as is much of uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, is, is highly vulnerable to climate hazards all different sorts, droughts, floods, climate variability, growing season reductions, higher, higher growing season temperatures, or various combinations of these. But I am also coming from the perspective that one of the transformations that we need to see is a transformation in the research community, in the ag research for development community. Some of us have characterized it as fragmented, inefficient, with duplication, overly supply-based, operating in silos, hampered by a fear of failure. We've got a very short-term orientation linked to funding cycles. And unfortunately, our key measurement is publication as opposed to societal imp having societal impacts. This kind of system makes it extremely difficult to deliver end-to-end -end sustainable and scalable solutions. So one of the transformations we see is also happen, has to happen amongst ourselves. So here's the positive news. The CGR has put climate change at the center of its future strategy. So that it will be a high level objective of the entire CGIR. The two degree initiative is part of the attempt to do research for development differently as business unusual. And if we took look at this diagram on the right, scientific credibility is up the top there. And in the, in the past and right up to today, mostly science is still measured by the numbers of publications one gets into esteemed journals. But our position is, is that we actually have to do well on all these dimensions of research for development very targeted and demand driven research, participatory with multiple stakeholders. We have to do lots more outreach, building capacity around solutions, communicating around solutions. And we have to have opportunism and flexibility to fit in with policy processes so that our science can also be uh, changing the narrative. So the whole uh, 2D, 2DI, two degree initiative is going to focus on various challenges. And uh, the One Health platform in West Africa is one of them amongst a number of other ones. So this West African challenge has got a thematic focus as well as a regional focus. 
we hope that it will be a, a, a great way of doing business in relation to pests and diseases that can then also be taken to other, other challenges. So we see South-South collaboration as a key part of the 2DI. One of the th pieces that we really want to change is how we do that research. We, so we want to be embedded with implementation partners, policy partners, partners that have got a ambitious and transformative agenda. In, um, the, in the West Africa case, we're hoping that we will partner with some major organizations that are, are, are focusing on development and, and be the knowledge partners to, to help drive that development and transformation. Just to say that uh, pests and diseases have perhaps been one of the most underrepresented areas in the climate change discussions. And so this particular challenge is going to be really interesting in terms of the thematics and how, how can we really bring pests and diseases much higher up in the global discussion on climate change. The 2DI uh, initiative will have a number of global, the uh, global themes cutting across all the initiatives. These haven't been decided upon, but perhaps they're going to be related to our overall theory of change. And this is the draft theory of change. Technology is important. Uh, digitally enabled climate services. How are we going to reach 500 million farmers in the next decade? That's the global challenge. We believe digital is going to be super important. The amount of funding coming into the food system cannot be just public development fund and climate funds. We have to leverage private sector into the, into the uh, food market chains. So it's also thinking about market development and resupplying supply chains. And if it's a strong private sector approach, we really have to think about empowering local organizations, women and youth. And ultimately, if one wants to reach scale, we have to have the right enabling conditions. So this is an overall theory of change. And from that, we will select some of the global themes that will be tackled in 2DI. For example, something around climate informed advisories, perhaps something around sustainable finance. Each of the, each of the challenge regions will have three kinds of components. The bottom circle, the increasing the access to the innovations. The second circle, how do we get much more climate informed information and advisories and services out to farmers? and the service providers, and also the policy level, getting the right policy and institutional uh, 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 incentives in place. And perhaps some global themes as well, such as empowering farmers, oops, sorry, low emissions supply chains, leveraging finance for climate action. So thanks very much. And I really look forward to this initial discussion uh, as to the themes and the sub-themes that are likely to be relevant in West Africa. Thanks a lot. Good. Thank you very much, Bruce, for that presentation. Helps us set the scene. So now let's listen to the second one from uh, Christina. And Christina, we will run your slides from this end. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you this today. I see many friends in the audience as well as new friends that uh, have yet to be made and met. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you, if you wouldn't mind pulling up my first slide, um, I'm going to be speaking to you about the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, next slide. If you don't mind. Great. Um, the Global Commission on Adaptation was launched uh, a year and a half ago um, in the Netherlands, um, and its uh, purpose is to, to really mobilize um, greater momentum, political visibility, attention um, and funding, and ultimately action on climate change adaptation, which has long been um, somewhat uh, ignored relative to, to the mitigation, at least in, in, in many parts of the world. Um, the commission is, is co-chaired um, by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon 
uh, Bill Gates from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Kristalina Gorgieva, the head of the um, International Monetary Fund. Next slide. The, the Commission's work has been divided into two phases. Um, the first phase is um, really focused on engagement and, and building coalitions and analysis and um, resulted in a flagship report that was released last September just ahead of the UN Climate Action Summit. Um, the report is called Adapt Now and it, it really calls for a revolution in planning, a revolution in financing, and a revolution in understanding um, in order to, to take necessary action to build resilience to the impacts of climate change. Um, and as part of that revolution in understanding is, is, is the theme of where we find ourselves today with this discussion. The, the second phase of the commission um, was launched in September um, at the UNCAS summit and um, was really the launch of eight action tracks, which are meant to catalyze and galvanize more funding, more attention and more action on climate change. Um, I won't go through, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide, um, I won't go through all of the action tracks. Um, there, are, there are eight of them in different sectoral areas on cities, on nature-based solutions, on finance, um, many of them very cross-cutting. I won't go into them um, in detail, but if you're curious, I urge you to, to take a look at the website to learn more. For the food security um, and um, agriculture action track, we have a goal of improving the resilience of 300 million smallholder farmers by, by 2030 um, and various initiatives um, undergirding that, including work on digital advisory services, including work on improving market linkages um, for climate resilient value chains. Um, but I want to focus in on what we're here to do today, which is um, part of a series of listening sessions to really help inform the CGIR's um, two-degree initiative um, so that it is demand-led, so that it is grounded in the priorities of farmers, civil society, universities, national institutions, um, in order to develop a robust research agenda for, for action. Um, the Commission was involved in mobilizing um, over $790 million uh, that were announced last, uh, last September um, in support of the CGIR as it puts climate change at the center of its, of its mission. Um, and so this is the other side of that coin. Um, it's not just about mobilizing funding, it's really about mobilizing the right agenda, asking the right questions, and building the right partnerships to, to really have a transformational impact. So, so that's uh, what we're here to do today. And I, I really look forward to listening and, and learning from you all about what, um, what, is, what are the exciting opportunities and issues um, for, for this region. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Um, so let's listen to the third part of this uh, introductory presentations uh, from May Guri before we have a short moment to reflect and discuss on those. Meguri, please. Yes, um, please. Uh, yeah. Are you showing my, my, my slides? Yes, um, it's coming up. Yes, so my job, my job is to give you uh, a little bit more information about the One Health Platform for Climate-Driven Pests and Diseases uh, in West Africa. Uh, can you put it in presentation mode, please? It's easier for people to see. put it in yeah, presentation mode and then you move to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, the, the One Health, as we see it, is a collaborative, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach where we aim at working at the local, national, regional and global levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people animals, plants, and their shared environment. Pests, diseases, and other biotic stresses are major threats to the health of crop, livestock, humans, and ecosystems, now certainly convoluted by the current COVID-19 pandemic. We already know that climate change will affect the distribution and dynamics of both old and new pests and diseases. 
We are also aware that climate change will disrupt complex interactions and trade-offs between different ecosystems with huge adverse economic implications. Next, please. So our advanced climate-informed One Health approach builds on the CGIRs and partners track records in this area. We are framing the nexus of crop, livestock, human health, ecosystem health, pest and disease epidemiology and control, food production, food safety and nutrition. <clears throat> but in this initiative, we want to look at these problems and also opportunities from a climate change binocular or lens. Next, please. So we are trying to link the One Health to climate change in, in this initiative. And then we course, we look at the overall challenge, which also Bruce mentioned in his introduction. The global population will increase from 7.7 .7 billion currently to 9.7 billion in 2050. And the majority of this growth is expected to take place in Sub-Saharan Africa. Already today, the African farmers are losing 20 to 40% of their harvest to pests, diseases, and spoilage. And these crop lo losses, they could have provided food requirements for up to approximately 48 million people. And we can only calculate how many hectares of rainforest we could have protected if we could save those crop losses and of course also the biodiversity that comes with it. Next please. Um, so um, based on that we have tr tr uh, created four strategic priorities that we would like to present to you and we also want your opinions on them later on. Next please. So the first priority is horizon scanning and building early warning and rapid response systems. The overall objective is to provide seasonal and long-term forecast and management options for bio-risks affecting plants, animals, people, and the environment. Specific objectives is to have data infrastructure and climate and environmental variables and bio-risk characteristics. The second one is prevention surveillance, diagnostic, and ICT tools available at local, national, and regional levels. Next, please. And just to remind ourselves, you know, that horizon scanning, early warning, rapid response is very important because major outbreaks caused by newly introduced pests and pathogens, we can list them, and I have only listed a few. Uh, for instance, the banana bunchy top virus, discovered in 2012, potato cyst nematode, discovered in 2014, Fusarium wilt tropical race 4, 2013, papaya mealybug, 2010, fall armyworm, and tuta absoluta in 2016. So these are just a few, but it's necessary to remind ourselves. Next, please. Uh, the second priority is management of climate-driven biorisks. And the overall objective is to prioritize and manage the most serious existing and emerging biorisks in agriculture. Specific objectives is to have common tool set for assessing and managing biorisks. The second objective is to have biopesticides, biofertilizers and biological control agents developed and deployed against current and high risk future biotic stresses. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to dwell a little bit about the as aspects of the invasion management process. If we look at the green arrow, it describes the stage of invasion from introduction uh, through survival, establishment, spread, and then comes the harm when the pest has already established uh, at a larger scale. We have different management options along the stage of invasion. And of course, if we look at the cost and management efficiency, we can easily see and also imagine that the lower cost and the higher efficiency are, is at an early stage of invasion, while the opposite is a fact 
is, is, a, a, is a fact when we come to the level where the pests are doing harm over a large area or on multiple crops. Next slide, please. So the third priority is harnessing high throughput technologies for food safety and health for mega cities. And the overall objective is to improve food safety and health for mega cities under a climate change context. The specific objectives is to have climate smart and bio-risk resilient cropping systems and crop varieties. The second one is to enha have enhanced human health in relation to water, soil, plant and animal health for sustainable quality food production. Next, please. So the fourth priority, mainstreaming bio-risk management into national and regional development programs. The overall objective is to establish a platform for sharing information on climate change related bio-risks and to influence policy dialogue and advocacy. Specific objectives, updated regulatory framework on bio-risk management. The second one, to strengthen capacity of national and regional bodies on the framework and on the use of bio-risk management techniques. And here, we clearly would like to work with the, the Inter-African Phytosanitary Council, the IBAR, the SPS focal point at the African Union, and definitely with SPS focal points uh, in each of the country, countries who would be interested to participate in this. Next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, this grand challenge is meant to provide support to agricultural producers, management, management of bio-risks, to cross-government approaches to address climate-driven food health risks, to institutionalize capabilities for early detection of emerging threats and rapid response, and to new technologies for biocontrol and other nature-based solutions to pest management and control. And as Bruce also mentioned, we anticipate that West Africa region will serve as a model for what can be achieved in this grand challenge prior to scaling to other regions in Africa and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. So we have already introduced the core team, and I don't need to repeat that, but I think it's very important to say at this stage that we really want to increase this partnership to national, regional, and continental institutions, some of which are present here today, to other CG centers, because clearly my presentation is slightly biased towards plant health. Uh, we want to work with international institutions and we want to have donors and investors on board. Uh, and that was my last slide, I think. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, May Guri. Um, I think those three presentations were all good uh, scene setting. Um, so I'm just going to give a chance to maybe one or two uh, quick thoughts or feedback from any of uh, the participants on the call. Remember, I had asked for people to, you know, raise their hands and I'm scrolling through the participants list. I still don't see any hands raised up. Um, does that imply clarity of the content or uh, agreement with everything presented? Okay, so um, fine, I see two hands up. Uh, let me start with Dr. Lokosu. So unmute and then uh, make the contributions. And then uh, after that, we'll hear from Chris Dickens. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tunde. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Rukosu. I'm from ECOWAS, Oahu. And uh, I'm, I was really excited by the last uh, presentation from Megory. And I really appreciate the idea of establishing a one health platform. I just want to contribute and say that this initiative should really also look at sustainability issues. Uh, I want to emphasize that because this initiative will help West Africa to set this initiative up 
but definitely we should uh, 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 permit regional organizations and also countries actors to play relevant roles, relevant roles in that in order to beat uh, 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 sustainability. It's really key, especially when we are talking about bio risk management. Thank you so much. That's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you for that succinct uh, feedback, Dr. Lokoso. Um, could we hear also from Chris Dixon, Dickens, and uh, then after that we'll hear one more from Maiga. And then um, I would also like to request that we make use of the chat uh, box so that we can also capture the other messages uh, that, that you may have to give on this uh, presentation. So Chris, please. Uh, thank you. Greetings, everybody. I'm sorry I didn't make the introductions at the beginning, but um, so I'm from the from IMI, the International Water Management Institute. Um, you know, looking at the at the project plan, um, it comes up a couple of times is the issue of ecosystems and so on. And and you were looking considering whether you need an SP five, and so I'm I'm just really suggesting to have an SP which is devoted to like agroecological principles, how you know how to actually embrace ecosystems as a as a means of control of pests. You know, there's a lot of literature that's come out that um, in this age of lots of pesticides and so on, the the actual um, output that farmers are making is becoming less than it was before, especially the, the financial output is becoming less than it was before they started with pesticides. So really just to consider ecological agriculture or agroecology, whichever you want to, where you want to look at it as a possible work package. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I think that was a comment, right? Um, rather than a question, right? Um, so um, Maiga, I can see a couple of hands also coming up. Um, could I also request that uh, some of this, because we may not be able to take all the hands that are up now, but uh, could we make use of the chat box and put in some of that feedback into the chat box so that uh, they are all captured uh, when we are reporting about this event? Maiga, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the presenters. And I want to emphasize on uh, what they say. Uh, Really, uh, pests are, uh, I can say, the, the, the forefront uh, in the climate change impact study. That's, uh, that's right. So, uh, at uh, uh, Agrimet, uh, Agrimet is uh, a technical department from SILS. SILS is the uh, Interstate uh, Permanent Committee for Drug Control in the, in the Sahel. So uh, uh, SIPS is uh, a regional body uh, working on, on climate change. Uh, and, and in this context, we support uh, member countries to implement policies protecting adaptation and mitigation of climate change, and also uh, to prepare, uh, to help them to prepare their determined uh, national contribution. So uh, in this way, we also conduct uh, climate change studies on agricultural production systems, but also uh, on socio-economic uh, impact. But uh, as far as first uh, are concerned, uh, little has been done so far. But we aim uh, to give uh, more emphasis uh, to this, and in particular to, to major pests in uh, the West, uh, West Africa region. Uh, we are currently uh, implementing a program on locusts. Uh, as you may know, uh, locusts is a very serious threat in uh, East Africa now. So uh, we are aiming to develop uh, a tool to prevent the risk of outbreaks in West Africa. And uh, in this context, we would like to study the impact of climate change on the dynamic of uh, areas where uh, locusts uh, uh, yeah. So, Thank you, uh, The regional body uh, agreement uh, is really interested to participate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maiga. And um, Maiga, I'm sorry, but uh, a couple of the participants are also saying they didn't quite clearly catch your your comments.
could you do us a favor and type it in into the chat box so that it's it's more clearly captured um okay so i will shift gears um again and i will encourage you also uh, participants to keep on uh, putting the comments and and feedback into the chat box i have two that have just come in um one from pair saying great and clear presentations nice remark by bruce campbell on the need to transform research along with the need to transform the food system and then another one from robert zogmo and what are the kinds of ambition or targets of the one health platform is looking for in west africa e.g. what millions of farmers benefiting from digital and early warning, warning information on pests and diseases. So keep them coming in that chat box so that we, we record all that is, uh, that is relevant there. Now let's shift gears to the second part of this webinar, uh, which is the regional scene setting. I guess this is more like the more specific now on One Health and, uh, and what its uh, aspirations are. So the first presentations will be from uh, Yemi Akinbamijo of FARA. Uh, we have your presentation, Yemi, so just unmute yourself and please proceed. Okay, Yemi. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to say a few words about uh, the, uh, the title of my presentation, which is the leveraging on FARA's partnership model to confront the climate-driven bio risks in, in West Africa. Basically, <coughs> the whole idea is to really look at this, the strategic priorities uh, one to four and to see how do these dovetail with the kind of work that FARA is doing. I will spend one minute just to speak about the architecture of FARA. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Thank you. So as you can see, um, from the top, unfortunately, I cannot use a pointer from here. But from the top, um, we are belonging to the global fraternity, the GIFA. And then FARA is responsible as the apex institution for the continent. And it's also underpinned by four sub-regional organizations. And um, the one for Western Central Africa, of course, is CORAF. Then we have one in Southern, we have one for East, and then we have one for the North. And the one for Western Central Africa is also underpinned by 22 countries. So if we look um, into the 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 next slide can can i have the next slide but just to say that we've got these 55 national agricultural research institutes which in themselves are very small and limited in terms of uh, uh, the mandate and the capacity to cover the different agroecologies but working with regional institutions like the ECOWAS, like the CORAF, has actually helped um us in developing the kind of synergy that FARA needs. Synergy and partnership is everything. I've listened to Meiguri, I've listened to Bruce, great talks, but we need to merge this uh, and, and see how to take this, this forward. Um, we, we see a lot of um, synergy, a lot of um, overlaps with uh, the work the great work that far um, that Coraf is doing, and we will be able to also um, piggyback on it and dovetail this into some of the strategic priorities in a way that confers mutual benefits. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, just to say a word about the FARA impact pathways from the bottom, the functions of FARA are in three folds: to increase productivity improve competitiveness, in other words, deal with this, this massive loss of, um, of produce post-harvest and to see how we can improve the value chains. And the third area is around resilience, um, and which is very central to what we're talking today, the issues around bio risks, climate change, and how to, to deal with them. And then, can I have the last, um, the top line, please? Thank you. So this is supposed to then um, lead into these four impact pathways of um, 
the food security, incomes and jobs, increased resilience, and also to give us um, improved natural management systems. Can I have the next slide, please? Join Thank the you. meeting. So Farah has actually um, built up what we call the IR4D model, the Integrated Agricultural Research for Development model, which is what you see on the left side of the screen. And through these, uh, we built partnership models that rely unistic, uniquely on what we call the institutional alignment and mechanisms to galvanize key stakeholders and also strengthen the ecosystem for the development of joint response. So this kind of model has been proven and uh, Farah is very happy, will be very happy to put this at the disposal of, um, of BMAF. And we also see that this can galvanize key stakeholders to strengthen the ecosystem, develop joint response mechanisms, and also to deal with emerging technical and innovation issues that can also include the bio threats that we're talking about. And the left side so shows how um, the architecture, how we, we, we deal with from local, national, so up to the global level. And at the bottom there, you see the, the threefold area of the human health, animal health, and the environment, how they interact, and we take the issues up through this um, model. So innovation platforms has been one of our key strengths and what we've put on the table for the um, for, for transferring technologies and, and putting things across to the last mile. And that will also be on the table for this um, program in terms of how to manage bio risks. Next, please. It takes me now to the strategic priorities. And um, I'm going to look at these as the entry points of FARA and CORAF, for that matter, to each of the four strategic priorities um, of BMAF and the grand challenge um, of, this, of the 2DI. So we, we take SP1, which has been very nicely laid out by Meguri, um, using FARA's uh, pathways of delivery. We have the FARA knowledge management and decision support um, structure that helps us to actually deal with research clusters that are targeted, targeting and supporting data infrastructure, the use of ITC, I mean ICT rather, not ITC, and tools that can be used to confront bio risk. We have also, in the recent past, developed capacity in FARA on what we call the African Foresight Academy, which is actually currently running some series of training um, online as we speak. We are now in the second or third of eight series of um, online things. And this can be put at the disposal um, of this initiative. We'll be very, very happy to discuss how this goes further. And in, I also would like to say that this um, SP1 will tie in very much with our science agenda priorities towards attaining the CADEP objective, the Malabo, the SDGs, the CISA, all of the African Union. And this is being implemented through what we call the African Foresight Academy under a new initiative that is called the CADEP XP4, um, which is currently ongoing, funded by the European Union and managed by IFA. Next slide, please. It takes me now to how we deal with the managing climate-driven bio risks. And in this context, um, FARA's involvement with the TAP, um, the, the Tech Tropical Agricultural Platform, and the subsequent development of a framework of, uh, for practical approach to capacity development for agricultural innovation may become, may be leveraged in the One Health Initiative within the West African sub-region, which is in itself is the tropical region. So we'll be very happy um, to, to put our, um, our, our infrastructure and our system in this direction. In addition, since most of these tropical regions also fall within the global south, Farah has been dealing with the, um, the South-South Technical Cooperation Strategy, and we use what is called the Holistic Empowerment for Livelihood Program, the HELP, as one of the instruments to build capacity and to serve in strengthening sub-regional cooperation 
and capacity for prevention, for surveillance, for diagnostics, and we use this through diverse technology transfer and knowledge sharing processes. We will be glad to actually put this again at your disposal. Very quickly, I'll be closing on the, the third one. Just give me the slide, SP3, on harnessing the, the, the high throughput. So this is about technologies um, that FARA has been pushing. And one initiative that has been extremely phenomenal is one we do with the under the German government sponsorship, the BMZ and ZEF, um, and also where uh, Professor uh, Christian Boga Mesa is coming from. Um, we have the PARI, the program for accompanying research and innovations. And this is actually helping to drive requisite innovation to the last mile. The same thing we're doing with TAT. And um, in, in this, in this um, context, we also have a new initiative that is looking at the common African agro parks, the parks which, I mean, the CAPS, rather, C-A-A-P. So this is an initiative that is supposed to really um, deal with mega um, inputs and, I mean, mega production of staples and, and crops that can ultimately drive the AFCTA, the African Free Trade Continental Trade Agreement. Um, last, can I have the last slide, please? Thank you. So this is around mainstreaming the bar risk management, um, international and regional developments. Uh, FARA is the custodian of the science agenda for agriculture in Africa. And we will be very happy to put this um, into the, the pipeline. And um, we'll be very happy to, to work with, with um, BMAP in this, the, the SP4. Um, is the mainstreaming of the science agenda for agriculture into the NIPES. So, and it is also a regionalization of research hubs that um, CORAF has been working on, which is what you see in the lower graph there. And we will ensure that meeting this, the objective of sharing information on climate change related bar risk and to influence policy dialogue and advocacy. So this is, I think my time is up and I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you. And my apologies, I forgot to switch on, switch on my video. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yemi, um, for aligning um, models and um, initiatives in far uh, that are available through FARA so clearly with the priorities for this uh, challenge, uh, grand challenge. Now we will move straight away to. Dr. Yao Bernard Kofi of ECOWAS with his presentation, please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity to, for ECOWAS to introduce uh, what we have done so far regarding One Health. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you and uh, let me uh, highlight the fact that uh, I'm participating to this webinar with some colleagues. Dr. Vivian uh, who is the director of the Regional Animal Health Center based in Bamako. Dr. Lokosu, who is the head of division uh, in charge of uh, regional one health coordination in Wau, and another colleague, Benoit. Uh, I'm happy to introduce to you the ECOWAS One Health Framework with the view for future collaboration with your initiative. I listened to the, to the first speakers and uh, the four SP you define are relevant, and I think that uh, they will offer some possibility of cooperation within the implementation of ECOWAS regional one health framework. Next. Next, please. Next, okay. So, um, 
like you can see the recent epidemic highlight the importance of human animal ecosystem interface in the evolution of emergency of pathogen next uh, so ECO has organized uh, various meetings uh, and uh, from uh, this meeting the head of state of ECO has decided that we should set up a regional panel framework. This one regional panel framework is uh, us by West African Health Organization. Next please. So this is the structure of the, the regional framework. I don't know if all of you can see, but uh, you have the uh, institution involved uh, in the framework. Like I said, you have uh, WOW, West African Health Organization. You, you have the, our regional center for animal health. You have also the Environment Directory, which is in uh, uh, Agriculture, Environment, and uh, Water Resource Department. The next, please. Next slide, please. So it is important to share with you what has been done regarding policy. As you know, Equas is a regional economic uh, co community and the commission coordinated the action. So regarding WOW, what have we have done so far within the regional uh, one f framework, this is the slide before this one. This one uh, highlight the, the drivers and the regulation which have been developed regarding agriculture. We have uh, Regional uh, Agriculture Policy ECOWAP, which was uh, adopted in 2005. And from ECOWAS, within ECOWAS implementation, we have different partners, including uh, CORAF and uh, AgriMed and uh, different other partners. And we have uh, developed also some regulation related to seed certification and control. We have pesticide regu registration regulation, health safety of plant, animal, and food, uh, as well as management of veterinary committee and uh, fertilizers, trade and quality control. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, environment, we have uh, ECOWAS environmental policy, and uh, we adopted also a regional vulnerability re reduction and climate change adaptation program, as well as the regional forest convergence plan, regional biosafety regulation, and uh, all of uh, those policy and uh, regulation and plan are the driver for action. And the, the next slide, please. We have also regarding the regional animal health center. We developed some, uh, we set up some regional veterinary committee. We have uh, organized some training and uh, it is important to we put in place a strategic action plan with uh, on highlight pathogenic avian influenza. Next. So what I introduced to you is some policy and driver adopted within the implementation of some activity regarding when it's come to health axis, agriculture environment axis, as well as uh, animal health axis. We speed up so that we didn't, it seemed that I didn't introduce the slide regarding uh, WOW, but we will get back on it when uh, we will uh, answer some question. The next slide, please. So we have, 
within the implementation of non one health, we have some partners like the World Bank, the African Bank of Development, and uh, some uh, technical partners who support us within the implementation of some project. We have a RDC project. We have also involved uh, in the implementing, implementing of IDS SCR strategy. Next. Wow, some uh, slides have disappeared. But anyway, before the future direction for ECOWAS, it is important regarding the four SP you, you define to, to link with the entry point. As you know, one health in ECOWAS is uh, the foundation is one uh, is health, environment, and uh, Animals. So regarding the environment, we think that uh, when we met in Lome last year, we agree with uh, all the partner that for each axis, we should set up a one health platform. So when it's come to environment, there is one health platform on environment. And environment is articulated on the environmental matrices, matrix land, water, biodiversity, and air. So for each of the priority thematic, you have a platform. So uh, the question is to link the SP you define to one of the platform and try to inter interlink with the human and animals. So that this is uh, an exercise, exercise that should be undertaken, should be under, under, undertake, undertaken. Because we need uh, to have an overview to define some outcome, outcome with some indicators so that based on your SP, how we can link with the entry point uh, of uh, the thematic I develop, I introduced to you in order for cooperation for partnership. Because for each of the thematic, when it's come for land, one have platform on land, there is partner group on the land. So it is uh, depend how are we going to work based on your initiative and initiative and link with uh, the entry point I highlighted. Next, please. Okay, this is the next, thank you. I didn't see some of the slide I will put, but it's okay. Uh, we are able, because uh, we have a, a team here, some of colleagues, like I said, are from uh, Wahoo, from uh, Regional Animal Center, and uh, from Agric, who will be able to provide you with some response. Thank you very much. Oh. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kofi. So, colleagues, um, we will allow maybe just um, two comments or uh, questions for clarification, please, uh, in the interest of time. So anyone, please? I have not seen a hand yet, but I'll try to check. You see any hand up there? Uh, that is from Dr. Maiga. Dr. Maiga, please go ahead. Please unmute and go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's fine for me. Thanks. Yeah, Dr. Sadu. Yes, please. Yeah, it's fine for me. Go ahead, please. Okay, 
I couldn't get you well. Are you saying you don't this have a pointer? Fine. Or is it muted from our side? No, no. I think what is this, Robert, is that his hand is hanging from the, the last session. Oh, from the previous yeah. session. Please, yeah. okay. Tunde, check. Is there any other hand up? Oh, Farah, yeah. I, uh, hear me, please, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to also express my excitement at the whole initiative beginning to gel together. I mean, listening to Meguri, listening to, to Bruce, and now listening to the gentleman, Dr. Maiga, I guess, from, from ECOWAS, has been, it's really creating some excitement within me. But I want to say this, there is a lot of expertise in West Africa, and these expertise are in silos. So what we need to work out, and somebody asked about sustainability, and I think that if we will succeed here, we need to master the art of integrating all of this knowledge. Now, let me say this. Um, a lot of grounds have been gained in the different disciplines, in livestock, in human health, in epidemiology, and so on. Now, I am a livestock person. I've had animals two times in this system, which I like, at least it's there. But, you know, we've, we've, we've said a lot, done a lot on what is called the crop livestock integrated systems. And some even went further to talk about crop livestock interaction systems. And they differ. But the thing is, for a greater part of my career as a, as a, as a field researcher, there is a lot that's been done in integrations between crop and livestock. Now we are coming into crop, livestock, and human. And this is interesting because we all interface at the ground level. For the farmer that we're aiming to help and all of this, we all integrate at the, at the, at the, bottom, at the bottom line. So my take is what are we doing with crop livestock integration and livelihoods, we do not need to start from the scratch. And I think that what we need to do is that there is a strong need to inventorize, I emphasize that, inventorize these existing best practices and to see how we can weave them together. That, and for the use of man, the, the, the utilization of all, of all of this in the context of climate change. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy. Um, in the interest of time, perhaps we could uh, now build any further advice, comments, suggestions uh, into the discussion session that we will go into now. And uh, before we start that, I would like to remind us the note that was um, shared ahead of the meeting, which is that uh, we need to come out with clarity on these uh, two questions. What is the added value of the Regional Grand Challenge One Health Platform for Climate-Driven Pests and Diseases in West Africa? And the second one being, what are the key strategic priorities that you will recommend this partnership to work on? Why and could uh, there be different priorities different uh, agroecologists uh, and countries. So we, with this um, in mind, uh, we are in the discussion session and uh, I open the floor for comments, suggestions, using the chat box is also highly recommended so that we can get in more inputs. So it's open now and uh, Tunde you help me with hands that come up. Mm. Any, uh, ah, yes, uh, Funke, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Asidu. Hi everyone. Um, I think I will say that this is a very interesting uh, conversation we are having here. 
and thank you very much for inviting you me to participate. Um, in terms of the added value of this platform, um, needless to say, the key thing here is that um, it recognizes the interconnectedness of uh, human well-being with all these other aspects of plant health, animal health, and environmental health. So it is really very unique, and I think it's a very good thing that we are bringing the climate change perspective into it. So it, promised to, it promises a very good um, uh, approach uh, and uh, evidence, uh, evidences that we can use to inform policy and practice in the region. So it's a very welcome initiative. Now, going to building on that uh, and following on, on what um, Dr. Meguri said, about the fact that basically the concept at its, at its, as it is now, though it recognizes all these dimensions, is still very much plant focused and yeah, a little bit on, on, on plant focus and you welcome uh, the, the intervention of other, other uh, centers. I would like to emphasize, bring it, putting on my Yumi hat, <laughs> to emphasize the fact that uh, water is a key resource for mitigating and aggravating human health risk. So the human health dimension is closely linked to water and the climate change dimension is also closely linked to water. So I can see in each of the SPs that have been defined, how we can actually look beyond uh, what we have here and integrate bringing in the, the water perspective uh, from the, based on the fact that contaminated water and act as a carrier of diseases as humans and also animals, they have both interaction with water resources and we use this for, for agriculture. So we have quite a lot of things to look at there from water quality aspect to uh, a, a way of monitoring analysis and modeling um, of, of water management, water systems to minimize the human health risk component. So and I think uh, where we can provide some uh, information to you hereafter. But I think looking at uh, a potential SP, we may, we may not, we can integrate the, the, those water dimensions into each of these SP. But I think the environment, um, I'm thinking about the environment human health interface needs some more focus. Maybe you want to consider that as a potential SP. Uh, maybe that could also be linked to what uh, Chris Dickens was saying earlier on about agroecology approach or not probably have to we can think about the environment and human health interface to give it more prominence in the in the whole uh, framework that is being put up thank you very much okay thank you very much Frank. i see francesco rampa please go ahead yes uh, thank you i all, all very very interesting i'm uh, francesco from the european center for development policy management i I want to refer back to, uh, to the theory of change presented by Bruce Campbell, because there, there was a quite a strong stress on, uh, on incentives and financing and, and, and also markets. So when I, when I look at the strategic priorities, I was wondering whether a fifth one could be trying to understand and then act upon a bit more the market finance and governance issues of uh, pest management. Because if you think of of the politics of why certain and the economics of why certain technical solutions like uh, biological or technological pest management doesn't reach the farmer or doesn't uh, fly at the policy level. These are related to bottlenecks. The, the private sector doesn't have an incentive to finance those. Or maybe there are certain politicians who have an interest in borders to remain tightly controlled and often pests move across borders. So if you look at these two issues, banks would be very crucial to be involved because ultimately what we're talking about is an increased risk through pest of an already risky business. So if you want climate smart solutions, you need to convince banks to invest more. And in order to convince banks to invest more in better pest management, et cetera, you need to uh, manage the, the risk, but you need to talk to those like banks and insurance who, who actually provide the services to, to solve this issue. And, and so one would be, if you want a subcomponent of a political or governance uh, strategic priority, one looking at private sector engagement in particular banks. And secondly, I would imagine really borders 
regional market management, that would be very important. And these are also very political issues. I know that ECOWAS has a lot of processes in place, but also understanding why certain borders do not act uh, in favor of better pest management will be very important. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Francesco. So I see uh, from Libya, uh, uh, Yes, yeah, uh, please, hello, please hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah. my name is Per Stalnak. I'm the research director at NIBU, the Norwegian Institute of Bioeconomy Research in, in Norway. And first of all, uh, I think this workshop has been a great value for me. It has been very informative and we strongly support this uh, initiative on One Health with a focus on, on pests and uh, diseases. And the question you raised, uh, Mr. Chairman, was uh, the added value first. And I think uh, the added value, which has already been uh, commented in the, in, the, in the chat and by, by Farah, for example, that we have the great possibility here to have a, an, um, a platform for unifying and, and compiling and bringing together the, the different expertise in, in the West African countries. I'm pretty convinced uh, about that uh, with an added value to, to have this international expertise uh, on board. Uh, and uh, for me, it's quite obvious also that this integrated and holistic approach is uh, is another uh, added value in, in, in line with, with pooling together these this um, pool of uh, expertise. Uh, another comment um, is, is, is that we have heard, uh, uh, and it's also written in, in the documents sent out on technologies and that there exist a lot of technologies. I think one added value would be that we have the necessary uh, scientific expertise within uh, within this program to really t test and validate this in a sound scientific manner in order for it to be properly introduced on on the market or at the the ground uh, level and uh, i'm not talking about scientific publications but that the scientific and research expertise could also I mean, be used as a facilitator for testing and validating these promising uh, technologies because there are a lot of them that are existing out there and also partly implemented in different countries and regions in, in Africa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for clearly highlighting these um, added value points on added value. Um, any other suggestions? Comments? Um, I see from the chat box, it can be difficult to convince banks and other donors and investors of the value of controlling pest and disease challenges without knowing the true burden. All the loss numbers I've seen are estimates that are over a decade old. It's often whoever shouts the loudest about their pet problem who receives investment. This is from Christina Owen to everyone. So it's a point for consideration. Um, kind of data that is available and how we bring it up to present it uh, in a convincing mm -hmm. manner uh, as the burden that we have to deal with. Um, any other suggestions? or comments. I have from the chat box um, from Farah from, uh, yeah, from Farah, the genetic strength of our crops and animals will be a cru crucial to improving livelihoods in the context of climate change. Therefore, a very good analysis of the systems in terms of genetic improvements, which in themselves are extremely dependent on many variables. The grounds gained in the resilience of the crop and livestock systems will translate in a synergistic manner the impact, uh, negative or positive, on human health and livelihoods in the context of climate change. And this is from a contribution from Farah. Um, we're still hoping there will be more comments on the two questions, the added value 
and then the strategic priorities. We've had some suggestion of uh, two additional strategic priorities, but the existing ones, um, any comments on them, particular ones that are of particular interest or, um, or that need to be further emphasized or expanded? I'm reading from here from Francesco that he agrees with Christina and that's why this platform could clarify the burden of different pests, et cetera, and then facilitate an evidence-based evidence -based discussion on where investment and policies need to improve. That's contribution in this. And Ponka um, from Uni St. Lancet is doing a report on health and climate change every year for the last five years and gives us, uh, provides us a link. So that is also a source of information. Tunde, any hands up, please? Review for me. So I take it then that um, in terms of the strategic, strategic priorities that um, we agree the four that have been listed are all very relevant. And then um, the suggestion on um, the importance of, I believe the uh, water, human, um, or the integration of uh, those components. Uh, first, we had crop livestock was discussed, but crop livestock, human, and then the other environmental issues that we could highlight if they are not really well captured in the existing uh, or proposed priorities. And then the aspect about finance, market, insurance, that we need to bring those elements also in strongly. Um, and then in terms of added value, um, building on what um, Yemi had said, that this is an excellent platform for bringing together the right expertise, um, that we have opportunity for holistic approach to dealing with these issues. And that um, also this will pull together the right expertise to validate the technologies that have been um, established or uh, that have come out of the various research organizations and uh, development uh, agencies. A further validation because we will have within this platform enough scientific expertise for the validation. I see from, oh, I see a hand up, Meguri, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, I just wanted to to say that, um, uh, of course, at this point, uh, we are at the beginning, you know, of a discussion with partners and potential partners in this uh, grand challenge. Um, and the main idea, if we go back to the webinar objectives, is basically to get the overall buy-in and uh, let's say endorsement of this audience that uh, the One Health that we we were presenting today um, is a useful approach for uh, the region. And um, since we are planning for a face-to-face -face meeting uh, later, mid-September if possible, um, that is where we will invite uh, a lot more of the technical people who can help us, you know, to outline the different questions uh, that has been raised. Um, for instance, uh, how do we make use of all the expertise that is already existing in the region? How can we um, create uh, um, an environment 
for working together and not in silos, uh, as uh, Yemi uh, rightly said. So I think um, um, we did not expect that we would go into a lot of details in this discussion, but more have a discussion on the higher level. Um, and um, of course, from um, our perspective, uh, we wanted to make a very holistic um, uh, definition of the One Health and also include the plant health on the agenda. And um, as far as I have heard, I have not heard much opposition against that. But uh, if that is wrongly interpreted, I would very much uh, like uh, people to ra raise their hands and, uh, and uh, let us know at this stage. Um, but from our perspective, we believe that um, if we can work together on these issues uh, and also combine uh, this into the very important work that is going on on the sanitary and phytosanitary aspects uh, on the continent and uh, in the region. And if we look at the SPS focal points, uh, we have all the different healths included in the work, although they all have different disciplines and they need to work uh, sometimes in silo because there are specific questions to be solved. So um, that is one of the, uh, the main things that I just wanted to add at uh, maybe as we are getting to the end uh, of this discussion. And uh, definitely we will be uh, very ready to receive input uh, uh, in writing from any of the participants later if they think that there are things that did not come up in this meeting that they should have highlighted. So thank you, Robert. Yes, thank you very much, Meguri. Yes, the, this will all build up to what we hope uh, will uh, be discussed in more detail in uh, mid-September. And so, yes, thanks for reminding us that there's room to send additional input even after the meeting to contribute to that effort. Um, I have a pair from Nibio with a hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's Per Stalnaki again. Uh, I, I was trying to put my hand down, in fact, because I think uh, my oh. guru actually clarified uh, the, the status of the document, and that was a perfect clarification. And I, th I also think that the, the level of details is, uh, is sufficient for a discussion. But I just wondered, uh, uh, on SP3, uh, what was the argument for restricting it to mega cities as such, because for me, SP3 is as relevant for rural agriculture or even some semi-urban semi or peri-urban uh, agriculture. But that is perhaps a deep, too, <laughs> too detailed question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Something we will think about uh, in more detail, unless maybe Meguri wants to comment a bit on it now or later. No, I think I, I can just quickly say that um, this is very much linked to the extremely rapid growth of uh, the mega cities uh, in Africa and um, the problem that those cities are facing, you know, in terms of bringing in food, but uh, also to actually get rid of uh, the, the food waste uh, and the environmental consequences of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, the other SPs do not uh, include uh, rural areas and peri-urban areas as such. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Tunde, there any more hands up? Comments, yes, okay. Um, well, let me uh, share this one from Christian. The problem that many funders see Pests and diseases as complex and messy and not yielding clear-cut and easy solutions is something one often hears. What about then to, among others, identify some quick wins? I will be thinking here, for instance, on some post-harvest pests or alternatively focus on some invasive pests. So yes, that we can bring in some focus and maybe in that uh, sense, catch the attention of the funders. 
Um, yes, I have from Funke here. Plant health is a crucial part. We, we just need to add the aspects of animal, human, and environmental stroke ecosystem health. And Abdul uh, from Korab says, Christian is correct. Quick wins are good sellers. Excellent, yes, yes. And from Bruce, I agree. Very important to have quick wins as a key part of the portfolio. Yes, so at least we then capture the attention and then, yeah, expand from there. These are very important points here. Uh, maybe, yeah, go up a little. Uh, oh, no, I could do that, maybe from here. Oh, from Alan. Um, I would say that understanding the links between the food and agriculture system and human health is not the same as taking a one health approach. Perhaps you could say how one health could be integrated into this process. Uh -huh. Anyone wants to address this? It's an interesting question. That understanding the links between the food and agriculture system and human health is not the same as taking a one health approach. So could you say how one health could be integrated into this process? Anyone with ideas on that? Or will may I? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. This this again is Yemi. Um, I, I I also struggled with the with the concept of One Health because I had it about 10, 15 years ago. But it's coming back and I'm excited about it. So I looked it up um, on the internet and I'm just going to read one definition here that one Health is a collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach, working at local, regional, national, and global levels to achieve optimal health and well-being outcomes, recognizing the interconnections between people, animal, plants, and their shared environment. Mm -hmm. So that's the definition that I have from online. Okay. Yes, it is quite comprehensive. Unless Alan, would, uh, would you want to follow up on your question in response to this uh, definition that has been given? No hand up. Okay. Okay. Um, while, while we uh, ponder on that, let me uh, introduce this one. I think, I don't know if Alan is still there. Um, there is a point from uh, Ibrahim Farah. How can West Africa best position itself in leveraging the biological re revolution arising from convergence of artificial intelligence, gene editing, and the new markets that will emerge and will likely include the One Health framework vis-a-vis -vis Africa's vulnerability, um, weak capacity on food and nutritional security? Hmm. That is something we'll have to also include in our thinking as we prepare ourselves for further discussion in the face-to-face -face meeting. That's a broader quest, uh, question. Um, but we have uh, one hand up from Abdul, please. Uh, Abdul, please, from Korab. Okay, I was just trying to unmute myself. Um, Sorry. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Robert, I want us to be wary of time because there are some other events and uh, uh, this meeting was supposed to be uh, just a stock taking, not a technical uh, in-depth discussion, which would be mm. taken at another uh, opportunity, I think. Great, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a good point. You've reminded us, bring us back to time. And Alan has already written that, uh, yes, he will take uh, this discussion offline. And um, yes, it brings us uh, actually to the point where with all those um, rich inputs uh, that we have already obtained, we will now actually, yes, so Abdul already has his mic on and it's uh, unmuted. So if you could please go ahead and then um, with the way forward. So over to you, Abdul. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Robert. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm not sure why I should be the one talking about the way forward. I'm probably the less knowledgeable about the topic in this room. However, I would like to put together a few take-homes that I think uh, will probably make consensus. Um, from the presentation of Bruce Campbell, whom I get to meet for the first time, uh, I can understand that the challenge is very daunting and it's also humbling for the way we operate today. 20 to 40 percent losses, uh, as my guru put it, translate easily into 48 million people who could be uh, saying thank you if we were able to reverse the losses. What they would say if we don't, this sense it does not allow me to pronounce these two words. But the issue is about praise or blame. And I think we have all the tools to get the praise rather than the blame. Transformative research that lead to societal impact in a very integrated way between the disciplines, but also the different agencies that are operating in the field is very crucial. And I believe that is something that we can also achieve. Now, another take home I have is that it all boils down to foresight and anticipation, which would be using the nexus of forecasting with that of preparedness for rapid and massive intervention. The little I know of plant health is dictating that I say something like being able to have a massive hypersensitive response uh, when there is a problem, but that can only happen if we are able to sense that we are under threat and then we mount the defense. Is West Africa a good idea as a guinea pig? Um, I would say this is one of the few cases when it is exciting to be a pig. And I think it's not something that I take lightly. There are already a number of things happening in the region that I believe this program that we are developing can build on. Just today, Many people in this room were part of another meeting that was convened by the World Bank and Cora to discuss part of what is now to be called the West Africa Food Security and Resilience Program. It is a relatively massive investment for the next 10 years with one component, component one, that will have to do with better ways of preparing. And I can see that the One Health uh, approach would be easily linked to that component one. Component two, which Cora would be directly link, uh, leading, has to do with better ways to avoid being uh, really struck, building resilience through research. And component three has to do with having sufficient food reserve to take care of our needs when we are in crisis. Now, where is the money that we need? I can't help but think that um, in times of crisis, we never know where the money comes from, but it comes, it is there. In fact, the president of uh, 
the World Food Program said something that I noted very carefully. It was in April of last year about the fact that for every dollar that is invested in development, we save $16 in uh, emergency response. So perhaps we could make a case for that $1 uh, be put aside and that part of it also goes to research to make sure that we are able to have something done ahead of trouble. That uh, we have a common environment under which we live, talking about plants, talking about humans, talking about animals, we all fall sick from causes that are in the environment and sometimes passing from uh, the humans to the animals or from the animal to the human. And certainly the fact that we all are now living together facilitates the interchange and it is really important that we have that one uh, health approach. Uh, I have really liked uh, Funke's comment about water. Uh, there are a number of chronic problems that are related to water, some extent, malaria, onchocerciasis, trypanosomiasis, and uh, we have also uh, now the fact that we have the, this environment that needs to be managed. And I kind of like what uh, Charles Dickens, um, I think it's Charles, if I'm wrong, uh, Dickens say, we need to be uh, thinking of managing the environment from an agroecology approach. So, Today may not be the time to exhaust the, top, uh, the technical components, and I believe we have a, a date for mid-September in Kotonu. The representative of the Minister of Agriculture, my friend uh, Dr. Francoise Aksoba, has said that we are more, very much welcome to Kotonu in mid-September if uh, 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 travel mm -hmm. now again. Mm -hmm. so, um, perhaps uh, Mayburi can tell us very clearly what are the next steps, but for me, I believe that we first need to have a, a summary of this discussion. All the contributions that have been made that are so nice need to be captured in writing and the information, information shared with all of us. As CORAF, I'm very pleased to be part of the initiative, uh, to be also as a person sharing the BMAF, uh, which is something that I'm arguing should rotate, and I hope that it will rotate very soon. Um, but having said that, uh, this would be my take home from uh, this discussion, and uh, I look forward to the meeting in September. Perhaps my guru can have a concluding remark from this uh, point. Thank you very much, Robert, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Abdul. So, Meguri, any final comments? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Abdul. And I also want to thank uh, all the presenters. And I want to thank uh, everybody who participated in this meeting. Uh, and I can assure you that um, uh, we will um, produce a comprehensive uh, outcome of this meeting. And we will also use the comments that you have kindly provided to update uh, the concept note and the draft and of course uh, we are also inviting all of you as uh, partners in this initiative uh, on the grand challenge on the one health um, and uh, then i think we can make it uh, a holistic one health uh, initiative because that is the aim behind uh, this meeting and uh, this uh, grand challenge and now I can see that it's uh, the time is on the dot. And uh, I know that uh, many people have other commitments. Uh, it is probably late in the, in the for some of you, early in the morning maybe for some. So thank you very much for everybody who participated and uh, we will look forward to your continued contributions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank so thank you very much. We are close now. Um, thank you. Thank you online and in person in September. Thank you. Bye all.